Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Microbiome Biomarker Discovery for Diagnostic and Therapeutic Applications. I am Sue Pam of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Before we start, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive event, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers are welcome too. You can do this by clicking on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your questions and comments. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Do you want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon at the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button located at the top right or use the Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to make sure to resolve any issues. This is an education seminar and thus provides free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process for obtaining your credits. Now let's get right to today's presenter. We're proud to welcome Dr. Todd DeSantis. Todd is the co-founder and director of bioinformatics of Second Genome, the microbiome company that's leading the development of novel medicine through innovative micro microbiome science. Todd has 17 years of experience designing and implementing bioinformatics solutions for analyzing microbiome microbial community dynamics. He is a chief architect of Green Genes, an international effort to catalog global microbial diversity that provides microbial ecologists with reference databases for DNA quality assessment, alignment, and classification. At Second Genome, he manages all informatics work, including identifying and recruiting microbiome scientist leaders, integration of multi-omic pipelines, cloud deployment for big data analysis, and therapeutic pathway discovery. I will now turn it over to Todd for his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Pham. So I'll get right into it. This is a, um, uh, a great time to be in uh, microbiology. The microbiome, as you know, has gotten very uh, high attention in lots of literature lately, and so um, I will be going through a little bit of that. So as a quick outline for what we're going to be doing today, first I'm going to start off with why biomarkers are important. Uh, if you're a therapeutics company such as Second Genome or you're working on biomarker discovery just in its pure uh, sense, uh, acad academic university or a, a biotech company. Um, and if you uh, haven't been familiar with the methods of microbiome biomarker discovery, I'll be touching on that. And then we'll get right into overcoming typical challenges that you will face, or you probably have faced already, in uh, determining what the best biomarkers are in a data set or in any data sets. So th some of those um, challenges are places where variation can creep in, and also how you're going to deal with all this big data. Uh, so then the last part, I'll actually have four cases, uh, four examples. One will be finding biomarkers in colorectal cancer. Another one will be pre uh, microbiomes that predict the drug response. A third one will be looking at how you deal with biomarker discovery if you have next generation sequence data versus hybridization based data. And then the last piece will be um, how you integrate many diverse data types uh, after you've already found biomarkers, for instance, to determine uh, a therapeutics um, approach. So in this case, we'll be looking at metabolomics, uh, uh, using many data sets to determine metabolites that um, will be interesting biomarkers. So first uh, topic is why biomarkers are important to a therapeutics company like ours and maybe yours. Um, well, it's, it's important because microbiome data analysis has provided much more information now about why a disease may occur and why patients may be responding differently to drugs and suggesting new therapeutic approaches. Uh, so for instance, there's been papers out about how um, you can potentiate your immune system to uh, work against cancer uh, using micro microbiome players. Uh, we know that there's um, connections to gastritis, um, uh, also pediatric patients with irritable bowel syndrome have been a, a top topic as well as uh, oral cancer and asthma and many other topics too. So any kind of type of search for almost any disease area, especially once it intersects with the gut, you'll find papers where people are looking for biomarkers that the microbiome can donate to the problem um, and to allow uh, better segregation of patients. 
So just a quick introduction to Second Genome. We love mining this data to, to find novel therapeutics. So although we're not a diagnosis, a diagnosis company, the biomarker part is one of those steps along the way. So we don't really look at bugs as drugs. So you may have heard of um, companies that are working on um, communities of living organisms to act as therapeutics. I'd call those probiotics. Uh, maybe there's next-gen probiotics that will be coming out. We don't uh, work so much on live therapeutics, but instead we look for unique areas where we can find a novel protein, a novel peptide, a small molecule therapy, and a traditional type of uh, pharmaceutical approach. And uh, we've built a microbiome platform that allows us to do this. We uh, identify and then express and screen microbiome bio bioactives. We use a large data database of external and internal data to uh, develop our leads. And we find that you need genomicists, you need computational biologists, you need in vitro and in vivo experts in laboratory uh, to build this entire pipeline together to, to, for microbiome drug, drug discovery. And so that's what uh, we, how we work here is we're not tr purely a bioinformatics company, we're not purely a laboratory company, we have to span all that, um, as I'm sure many of you are used to. Uh, so we have a pipeline, and our pipeline of drugs are really working on unmet, unmet uh, needs. So our you know, first drug that's um, in phase one is a small molecule. We have additional preclinical programs that are uh, mostly in proteins. Um, but our discovery programs really have to do with inflammation, metabolic disease. Um, and we think of our platform as a rapid approach to deploy upon a new indication uh, with partners. So the workflow for us um, also parallels the types of focus that you can take in branching off from um, raw data to a therapy or raw data to a diagnostic. So on the left-hand side, you can think of uh, fecal transplants, right? If you have hundreds of strains in a microbiome therapy, uh, that would be a full fecal transplant, a full community uses a therapy. Uh, more reductionist from that would be a consortium. We have a defined number of species that you pack in defined uh, relative abundances, uh, then to provide that as a pill, for instance, uh, for a therapy. The more reduction would be just sing take a single strain or uh, maybe an engineered strain or a naturally occurring strain. That's the traditional probiotic is in this, in this area. Our focus is even more reductionist. It's, it's to the bioactives themselves. So we look for the molecules that are produced or expressed by the microbiome um, that actually affect the host directly. And then we bring those into um, uh, a pill, for instance, right? So this would be uh, the drug development that goes from the bioactive to the actual B candidate. Um, these last two steps then is really what our focus is. We found that from the left-hand side, you have less specificity, less dose response um, control, uh, less intellectual property, and it's harder to control the uh, manufacturing of, of uh, these substances or these con consortiums. So to the right, uh, we have greater ability to address all those areas. So the basic steps in the platform that you might already have thought through of in, in your biomarker discovery is you start off with a large knowledge base, or you have to decide what clinical samples you're going to use. Uh, and then you probably have to deploy some sort of genomics know-how to uh, mine all that data. Uh, from that, you get a list of novel bioactives or markers. And then if you test them uh, for therapeutic effect, you can test those in in vitro screens or in vivo screens, and then, of course, get to the end. Um, so we think that the effect on host biology is really important. So we don't just look at biomarkers. We look at biomarkers that uh, can, in turn, affect the host and host this place to the human. Um, and then the novel, the novelty and the therapeutic approach in proteins and peptides, peptides is really large right now. There's so many unknown functions of the proteins and peptides that are made by the microbes uh, that we can use those um, uh, as uh, potential therapeutics themselves directly in inflammation and metabolic disease. And we think of this uh, pipeline, and you should think of this too, as a rapid system. The data is coming out fast, the papers are coming out fast, the competitors are moving fast, so uh, the, the timeline that you want to um, think about if you're starting this type of discovery is about three to 12 months to go through the raw data and, and reflect it against reference databases. Three to six months to pick maybe your biomarkers. If you're doing some therapeutics, three to nine months uh, to, to get through some in vitro and in vivo um, tests to validate if you want to go with a therapeutic from biomarker. And then, of course, from there to a novel drug candidate is very various depending on the type of um, 
uh, substance. Okay, so where we focus on is we've highlighted here in blue, um, which is after you take uh, your raw data reflect against reference data, um, the third part down here is this uh, beneficial and detrimental bacterial proteins and peptides we search for to make actual protein and peptide therapeutics. So although there's many ways you can branch off of this raw data and the raw biomarkers that you're going to collect, um, a company of our size, we have to focus on, on one uh, system. So we've, we've picked a couple of these, and our current focus this year is, um, uh, since we have our first stuff in phase one, our next wave is in protein and peptides. So this gets you now to the abstract that uh, you may have read already before coming in here, and so just going to touch on a few of the things that we're going to be working through today. So remember that we have challenges that exist in all phases from sample collection all the way to data processing. We decided to use the Amazon Cloud to overcome some of the big data questions. We use some machine learning, and I'll go over, I'll touch on some of those topics as well. Um, and then also you want to have a platform that, in our case, doesn't just do bio biomarkers, but also creates new hypotheses of uh, disease uh, causality, and so um, building a platform to do that as well is always important. And there's a few learning, learning objectives here too. If you're following along to uh, gain some new knowledge, you should be able to identify some disease areas where microbiome analyses are applied by the end of this talk. You should be able to differentiate what, uh, when you hear people talking about 16S profiling versus metagenomics versus metatranscriptomics versus metametabolomics. And so we'll go into a little bit of that and then you should be able to identify where variation occurs when you're going through the data. Um, and then also, uh, hopefully you'll identify the benefits of having um, uh, control throughout your whole process as well. Um, and these first four really are the, uh, the main part of the, the discussion here. So first, methods. So there's general methods that you might see in the literature already and you might have already deployed in your own um, production pipeline. So I'm gonna go over five of these. The first and probably least expensive and most popular is the 16S ribosomal RNA gene profiling. So the, in this case, knowing that every 16S gene that you collect from a sample can be attributed to a genome, not always, but there's many genomes in the human microbiome that have been well documented, and so the 16S genes help you know what genomes are in your, uh, or in other words, what species or strains are in your uh, uh, sample. So, the benefit of it is just do a PCR amplification. The PCR products themselves can be hybridized to an array or sequenced directly um, through Illumina sequencing, uh, for instance, the most popular approach now. And then you observe these counts. So every 16S gene, you try to find uh, how many counts fit into every bin. A bin might be a genus or species, depending on your resolution of interest. And then you're looking for changes in those frequencies across the data sets or across your uh, control and disease groups. Um, the downside about 16S is that every 16S gene is not necessarily unique for every strain. Many strains share a very similar 16S gene. And the 16S gene doesn't really tell you what the functions are in the microbiome. You can infer some functions, but to really find out the functions and really do more strain analysis, then we recommend shotgun metagenomics, which is the second bullet. In this case, you share up all the DNA from your sample, so, and you sequence many DNA fabrics from many microbes. And I put many, not all, for a certain, for a special reason. I'll talk about that later. But really, you're trying to take a sample of all the um, uh, DNA fragments. Uh, and then from there, you're observing which genes are changing their abundance and which taxa are changing in their abundance. So you have a second dimension to the data that's helpful for mining for biomarkers. The third approach, which is actually um, even more functional, if you're asking what is the uh, microbiome doing at a certain uh, point in time you take a sample, then metatranscriptomics is the way to go. So in this case, you shear up and sequence as many um, messenger RNA fragments from the microbiome as possible. And this could be a stool sample, a swab. But in thinking of a stool sample, has uh, many microorganisms expressing different levels of their genes. You're trying to take a sample of that and then you're observing which microbes change in their expression levels uh, compared uh, to doing group comparison or which uh, gene itself or maybe a cake orthologous group or an enzyme um, class is changing in its abundance across the uh, expressions data sets. Uh, the fourth one, metaproteomics, is when you fragment all the proteins that you can from a sample, you collect spectra from them, and again, you observe changes in microbial protein abundances. Uh, metametabolomics then is when you're collecting spectra from the metabolites and you try to collect as many as you can uh, either you might look at extracellular fraction or total cell lysates, but in both cases, you're going to be observing changes in metabolites. So one thing I want to point out across all these is that 
really the comparative analysis is important. We have um, many partners who come to us with uh, um, maybe without a hypothesis, they just want to profile their samples using one or more of these methods. And that's always interesting, of course, but really the, um, the, the, the findings that you want to look for is deltas, changes in the abundance that are significant, reproducible, robust across any technology. So you have to have comparison groups uh, to really capitalize on the investment that you've made into this area. So the last thing I want to point out is that you're really looking for reproducible changes in the abundance of the features, and those can be become, uh, become biomarker candidates. Okay, so I put together a small list of uh, what I've seen to be the necessary informatics capabilities that you'd want to have in place if you're going to start mining the microbiome for biomarker discovery. So I'll go into a lot of these um, in our examples later on, but just to quickly go through them, you need to have efficient compute capacity. Uh, we choose, chose the Amazon Cloud for ours because it's very elastic, meaning when we need more compute power, it's easy to scale up. When we're not using it, we're not paying for it. And then we went ahead and built our own software that bids for resources, uh, queues our, 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 um, our uh, queries and queues our processing and mapping, and then of course monitors how those are going. And so some, um, for instance, Amazon has some of those types of bidding and queuing and monitoring systems built in, so you might be able to take advantage of those, but we found you, might have, to make, you have to make a custom uh, type of uh, cloud deployment for a different pipeline, so uh, be willing to make some investment in time there. Um, other, some companies have lots of compute power of their own. I used to work at a government lab. We had plenty of it there, so we could do a lot of analysis there. But I've also found that even those large grids that might be owned by a certain institution can get backed up. Um, and so we've always preferred to go with a, a cloud resource where if you need to get something done, you can bid high enough dollars for it and get it done that weekend if you need to or that night. Next part is having reliable reference databases. So um, if you're looking at bacterial products such as their um, uh, metabolites, then you might have a database of all the gene expression changes that occur in a host when, it's, when affected by the metabolite. Uh, so that uh, is an part, important part to reflect your data against. You might have a microbial cheminformatics question. Um, we found that lots of the uh, chemical resources out there have various coverage for microbial um, uh, metabolites. So uh, we've found that finding it, you know, building your own system for that is important too. There's many diverse, diverse proteins that are known and many that are unknown, so building a database that can, or using a database that's covered all those are important. Um, and then knowing all the strains that are available and all the genomes for them, as well as 16S genes of strains that are cultured and yet to be cultured uh, are important too. So the third one on this, on this uh, part here is on, let's see, I'm putting an arrow here so you can make that work. So this next part is about raw data. So I want to highlight that because we found that if you take data from a paper that's been um, analyzed during a certain pipeline at a certain point in time, you might get one result. But if you go back to the raw data from many samples and you are to process that off the same pipeline with the, with the most up-to-date reference databases, then you're going to have a better view of the types of uh, biomarkers that could be found. Um, up on the top right, there's also software that you might have to build um, for doing different parts of your analysis, um, and I'll go into some of those later too. OLA is one of those uh, large integrated pieces of software that's important if you're looking at, in this case, metabolites that affect hosts, and that'll be one of the examples. Um, another exciting part now is quantitative de novo metatranscriptomics. So this is when you don't have a reference genome, you're finding new organisms in your data, and you want to find out which of their transcripts have a quantitative shift in their abundance. This is difficult when I mean, you don't have a genome to map to, so um, this is, it will take some effort to put this in place and validate it um, when, when you start looking for brand new proteins. We also feel like big data visualization is not necessary, but um, I would say it always helps the rest of the team see where your um, effort is going. So it's always hard to communicate big data to uh, maybe a set of biologists who aren't used to looking at that scale. So having visualization techniques are important, and machine learning helps a lot. We have a lot of variables that you can't predict. Okay. So when we talk about big data, it's because you might have some data in your um, auspices, but there's so much other data that's already been made that you should reflect yours towards 
that uh, you want to collect a large uh, number of these samples that are related to your sample. So the sa sample sources for us, we have partnerships, we have um, obtained retrospective clinical samples. We also have prospective, uh, prospective studies, which are ongoing, and data comes in from those. And also there's analysis of public data sets. So pulling those all together, and then this central image just represents our cloud that has many workers. Our data comes in, it gets queued, workers pick it up, process the data in a, in a set um, uh, protocol, bioinformatics protocol, and deposits the data back into our buckets. And we call these, these buckets our uh, term that Amazon uses for data storage uh, locations that get backed up and they're inexpensive and they, they're on demand. So you're not paying for hard drives, you're just putting things in buckets as you need them. And then from there they can move into a database for doing queries. So we found that after 41,000 microbiome samples processed with three different diseases, having 16S RNA, metatranscriptomics, metagenomics, many different diverse data sets, um, integrating that into a, a big data analytic framework, we couldn't find anything off the shelf that does that. So we've had to build our own system for that, um, but it's, uh, it's been worth it because you learn a lot along the way about the variation that you find in different data sets, which I'll talk about soon. After you have your data organized, you usually want to reflect it against a reference database. Um, there's a variety of them out there. We um, uh, support and keep updated the Green Genes database, um, which is the last version that's up on our website has a coverage of both cultured and non-cultured organisms. Our next version we're rolling out is a definite emphasis on the cultured organisms that are um, found in the human microbiome. So at the beginning of the Green Genes work, it was environmental and um, host-associated microbes, probably in balance. And now uh, there's definitely, uh, since, the, since the focus of microbiome research um, ha has increased a lot in the uh, clinical space, Green Genes is following that as well. So the next release, it'll be much more heavily um, geared towards the microbes that are, uh, uh, that are cultured already and are found with, uh, in human microbiomes. And the nice thing about using a, a, a reference database is that you're not relying upon um, an author's description of the taxonomy when they put an organism into a database. Instead, you have a standardized system of assigning taxonomic ranks and taxonomic names across all of your data so that you have a comprehensive way to move around in your data um, to find out which genera is changing or which family is changing in abundance uh, in a certain disease area. Uh, then a couple of databases we mentioned earlier was um, this database where we keep track of how microbial proteins or microbial metabolites affect gene expression in the host. And so this database uh, we call the BP effect, this bacterial product effect database. So, so there's literature mining that um, is done to find out if you have a metabolite, and this, um, in this case it's red arrow, means this metabolite has an increased effect upon uh, a protein, in this case we're looking at IL-10 production. And then on the right-hand side, we're, this is a, a, a um, evidence of an edge between two um, nodes. In this case, we have um, fluorotene, which is a, a chemical that is under microbial control. It could be, um, in this case, it's being a, it documented an inhibitory effect upon IL-10. So in this case, this is data that we generate in our lab. Other data on the left is gen generated and found in literature and in other labs, but pulling that all together to build what we call a network of uh, basically a graph database that shows all the effectors of gene expression that are known, and we're always adding to this as well, so that when we have a fresh data set, we can search that um, for um, insights. And then, of course, the cheminformatics, um, you might be an expert in cheminformatics and already found a solution for this. But when we looked at um, the cheminformatics systems that are out there, we found that KEG, Biopsych, IPA, Metabolon, even the IUPAC, we really have disagreeing um, nomenclature and identifiers, uh, and some of them haven't really worked well in organizing the microbial metabolites. So we pulled those all together and built our own Rosetta Stone between them. We call the MCHEM database, which uh, tracks about 28,000 different microbial metabolites. Um, the other two parts that might be important in your research is if you're doing um, work with uh, genes that express proteins, then um, the, a big protein database is important. So this is looking at not just you know, human proteins, but all the microbial proteins, which are much more diverse. So when we went through this process, we found that if we do replicate all the uh, proteins that are publicly out there, we still have 100 million different proteins. 
uh, to, to search against whenever we find new um, proteins in our uh, metatranscriptomics. And so we call this the HD Prot database, the high diversity protein database um, that allows us to uh, index what we find. Um, and then on the right side here, uh, when you find new proteins or find new genomes, you want to determine, or find new uh, fragments of genomes, and you want to determine that, has that genome already been um, sequenced or is that strain available at a cultural uh, collection, uh, then keeping a strain database up to date is important. So um, there's thousands of genomes that are coming out every couple months, and these uh, genomes are not getting into all the public databases fast enough. So we've had to maintain our own that allows us to um, quickly be able to search. Okay, so this next slide, I might advance it too much at first, but this is a case where you, this is a case where using internal and external data sets and integrated, integrating them gives you fresh insights. So in, here's a case where we had inflammatory bowel disease data. These are specifically ulcerative colitis um, patients and controls, and each dot on one of these plots represents one host gene that changed in expression. So these are what are called volcano plots, where the more um, to the right or left you are um, in a point, that's the greater the full change was from health, and the higher to the top or bottom is how significant that change was. So upper, um, so genes that are, or dots that are in the upper uh, left and right quadrants are the ones that are most significant. So in this case, on the left-hand side, we have um, genes that are high in healthy states that are um, knocked down when you have, the, or knocked down their expression when you're in the uh, colitis condition. And these were all taken from biopsies. So this is a case where we only have three data sets, but in typical cases, we're doing six to 10 data sets at once. And when you look at those, then you can find genes that are consistent across data sets. Um, so this is a technique that's you know, been around the GEO uh, website for a while, which is really important. Um, and so you might have used this before where you can overlap data sets and then run some false discovery analysis and find a set of targets that are not just um, one data set specific, but are robust across data sets. So this helps us find outliers, for instance, too, and the same procedure we use for microbiome data as well. Okay, so now we're on to uh, the typical challenges that you're going to face in finding biomarkers in microbiome data. Um, so the f way you want to overcome these is there's two major classes of overcoming. So the first place, place here is, is in controlling source of variation. If you know there's variation that's going to rise up, how do you control it? Um, in the biospecimen collection, shipping storage, in the how you extract molecules, how you prepare samples or run PCR, um, and then also avoiding the undersampling problem, which I'll talk about, um, because undersampling can look like large variations occurring, uh, but it's just because of the technique that's being used. Secondly, when you have all this data, how do you get all this data processed? Um, so uh, that's another uh, challenge to overcome. So here is a figure that's supposed to represent the different places where variation comes in. Um, and then there's an integration of all this variation that, that at the end gets spit out as a reliable biomarker. So on the very left-hand side, um, the true biological variation, that's what you're trying to find. You know, how much, um, what's the effect size of your biomarker between two groups um, by taking into account the natural biological variation among the uh, subjects that you, that you tested. That's really what you want to focus on. To get there, though, you have to make sure that you, as I go across from uh, you know, clockwise around this circle, you have to make sure you have the right study design and the right power, so you have enough, enough samples. And by not having those two things um, in place, that's going to affect your ability to find live biomarkers, obviously. But then we've also found that the way you collect, store, and ship biospecimens um, can have a big effect. The way you extract the molecules, the, the protocol you use, will have an effect. Um, which technique you choose to generate your data from the raw um, extracts is important, and uh, what bioinformatics pipeline you choose will have an effect, and then if you have the ability to confirm confirmatory testing by using a second platform or second test, of course, that always um, helps you hone in on more reliable biomarkers. So we found that standardizing from the outset is important. So when we go to um, retrospective studies, there's always a question of how well was that sample preserved? How is the DNA extracted? So our prospective studies then 
are, um, we have more ability to have control. So in that case, we'll have experimental design guidelines that we recommend to work with the clinician uh, to be able to obtain the sample in its most preserved form. And that will turn into clinical protocols uh, that will also um, be reflected in patient questionnaires. And knowing um, uh, what types of patients you're going for, of course, helps you have exclusion criteria uh, to get the right people. And then you collect the patient metadata, uh, and you want to collect that in a consistent way at the outset, because always try to go back to your patients, of course, and ask, more meta and ask for more metadata. Um, then there's a stool collection, storage, and shipment instruction sheet that we, that we produce uh, for the clinician to give, along with the stool, uh, like for instance, the stool genome collection kit, uh, that will be carried together, explained to the patient, and then they'll be able to pack it themselves and ship it. They'll have a shipping label, for instance, and the patients can ship the label, uh, ship the sample um, directly to our laboratories, or sometimes a clinician collects many samples at once, stores them in, in a unified way, and then ships them in batches. Um, and then once they arrive at our, our um, lab, then our molecular extraction protocols uh, allow us to turn them into nucleic acids, for instance, in this case. And the nucleic acids then go on to a data collection system. But having protocols in place from the beginning always helps remove some of the variation. Um, I, if you've done these types of uh, studies before, you might have found stool arrived at a uh, low temperature in some cases, high temperature in other cases, or uh, the stool is mixed really well with the preservative, um, and in other cases, you have a stool that might have come clumpy and it wasn't mixed well or homogenized with the preservative. And so that can bring in very sources of variation. So having good protocols, having people well-trained at, at the clinical sites, um, and then having uh, these, these shipments happen right away on ice in our packaging or whatever packaging you decide and keeping that consistent is going to make a big difference. Okay, once you have, let's say, stool or your, uh, your biospecimen in your laboratory, the choice of how you extract that specimen is going to affect which types of microbes that you're going to highlight in your analysis. So we did a test of this back in 2005 uh, when microbiome science was just starting and we had this capability to look at many microbes at once and we were wondering, um, are we looking at the microbes that are most revealed by our technique and not necessarily the whole spectrum of microbes? So what we did is we took, in this case, one aerosol sample. So we were looking at, um, in this case, we're looking at what gets breathed, what kind of microbes get breathed in by um, uh, just people who are, who are outside at uh, uh, four foot off the ground, we had collectors grabbing um, dust samples and we wanted to find out how we can find the full diversity of those dust samples. So we took the exact same large sample of dust collected from that height and from that one sample we split it into uh, five different groups, sorry, six different groups of samples and then each sample got extracted at different durations of bead beating. So the only protocol difference in this process was how long we bead beat. So on the left-hand side, we have four applicants of our negative control. And then we have the next step is when we, when we just put the, um, the biospecimen into the, the bead beating buffer, but never even shook it. So this is a, a zero second bead beating. The next one's five seconds, 20 seconds, 45 seconds, and then 10 times longer, 450 seconds. And then we ask ourselves with a heat map, for instance, to showcase which, micro, which microbial families in this case were highlighted by a certain bead beating. So if you compare on the left-hand side a couple of these different um, families, we had uh, the Flavobacteriaceae um, didn't show its greatest amount until you got to 450 seconds. So this is a case where if you wanted to highlight Flavobacteriaceae, if your hypothesis around that certain family, then you want to be bit at a longer duration to be able to um, un uncover that DNA and allow it to be available for your PCR. Whereas the other case, if you're focused on the Sphingomonadaceae, which are in the alpha proteobacteria, um, down here at the bottom, you see that those are easy to see just without any bead beating at all. Just putting them into the lysis buffer pops them open, you're able to access their DNA. And if you bead beat too long, then their signal drops, and you don't see uh, uh, as much abundance of those organisms. It's swamped out by the other DNA that gets um, into the system, or it's getting sheared up and so um, unable to be amplified. But the point is, if you just pick one protocol and you expect that you're looking at all of the um, different microbes, you're probably not. So we recommend that you run a spectrum of tests on your uh, extraction protocol to make sure that you know what you're looking at 
um, and what you're putting aside. And if your hypothesis is built up enough around a certain family of bacteria, then you'll be able to make a, a good decision about which um, protocol to use. The next thing is when you're looking at biomarkers, there's an undersampling problem in microbiome research that uh, is, is very important, but I would think that most bioinformaticists have seen it, understand it, but maybe a lot of biologists planning the experiment may not be as aware. And so um, I just want to make it really clear what this problem is. And the take home message, you want to avoid relying on present absent events. Um, because the sampling technologies that are out there, it's very difficult to make a, a true absent call. Uh, there's a great article that came out um, uh, from Rob Knight and Caparoso uh, and Jack Gilbert. It's an environmental journal, but the uh, take home message is really, really important. They took the English Channel and they sampled it every day for a year. And they sequenced 10,000 uh, sequences from every sample, the 10,000 16S sequences. And from that, they uh, wrote a paper about organisms um, being present and absent at different times of the year. But then they took one sample and sequenced it much more deeply. They did over a million reads from that one sample. And they found that all the organisms that were found throughout the whole year were all, were all present in one sample. So this, this basically changed the idea that when you have an ecosystem that you're studying, it's more likely that many of the organisms are always present in some level, but just in different proportions. And so when I talked to Jack Gilbert about this uh, article, uh, he said there's kind of, I asked him, you know, is, is it true that many things are many where? I mean, maybe not everything's everywhere, but many of the microbes are really in all, all different environments. And what I mean by that, all the human associated microbes that are seen around the world, are, they, are many of them always in any stool sample, just in little abundance? And he says, well, maybe, or maybe everything is every when. So any one point in time, there's probably some um, level of an organism in a sample, but you might not just be detecting it because you're not sequencing deep enough, for instance. And so I asked, well, why is that? And the, um, the analysis, or the, uh, let's say, uh, parallel I want to put is in uh, depth of diving. And I think this will help make it come clear. So right now, even what we call deep NGS, next generation sequencing, is not deep enough to really do present absence and calls and see everything in a sample. And here's why. But if I think of something very deep, I think of the uh, Pacific Trench, 30,000 feet deep. And a deep um, exploration event would go all the way to the bottom. Uh, maybe a robot, maybe uh, a sensor, a sampling uh, system. You'd want to go all the way to the bottom to, to sample the, the bottom. Um, so now let's make a parallel to one microgram of DNA. So one microgram of DNA, that's very simple to come by. If you take a, um, a small, uh, you know, one gram of stool, you're going to uh, extract lots of DNA out of there. It's easy to get about a microgram of that dissolved in uh, 20 microliters of buffer. Let's say you did a PCR application off of a skin sample, for instance, or a, a, a oral swab. Um, you might end up with a microgram of DNA very easily. Now, consider you shear that up into 500 base pair fragments. Now, if you do that, if you run the stoichiometry on that, you're going to get almost 2 trillion molecules. So that's um, you know, rounded down. 10 to the 12th, or 1 times 10 to the 12th. So that's a trillion pieces of DNA. So let's say that is my sample, a trillion pieces of DNA, and I want to sample that. So the question is, can NGS technology really sequence every piece of DNA in a sample and observe all the diversity? Well, not really. I mean, even if we sequenced from one sample, we went and sequenced 100 million reads, which is pretty expensive, and it's not really practical yet to do that at scale. Um, but if you even did 100 million reads, uh, of one trillion fragments, that's basically one ten thousandth. In a typical uh, library of 16S, you might make 100,000 reads, um, not even 10, 100 million. If you have a, a, a deep metagenomic sequencing project, then you'd probably do about 10 million reads uh, over hundreds of patients. Um, if you're going to do 100 million reads, you're probably going to be focused on a very few number of patients, or you've got lots of capacity. But even if you did 100 million, it's still one ten thousandth. That's a, it's a huge effort. And that's really equivalent to diving just three feet deep into this trench and calling it a deep dive. So whenever you hear someone talking about deep sequencing, you really want to ask them how many molecules was in the sample and how many were sampled. And then you can put that in proportion and really find out if you consider that to be deep sequencing or not. So with this, what occurs then in this case is that you end up with what we call sparse data. 
So when you have next generation sequencing data, um, if you were to arrange it in a table where rows might be all of the genes and columns might be all of the samples, you don't encounter all the genes and all the samples. So many of the um, cells in your Excel spreadsheet would be zeros, for instance. Your table wouldn't have uh, you know, the, the um, density to have lots. I gotta turn off my phone, excuse me. Okay, so when that occurs, you can make these plots. Um, and the top here is a plot that's showing um, for some single or organism RNA-seq studies, uh, it's trying to show the relationship between how deep you sequenced and how much of the total genes that you could encounter were encountered. And on these different, these are different organisms, different studies um, that came out of a Paulson paper in Nature Methods 2013. But they found that typically you might only find 15 to 85 percent of all the genes you could find in an organism actually found. Um, and these are under typical sequencing depths. Now that's somewhat of a problem, but there's statistical tests that will overcome that problem of sparsity. But the, the problem is much worse when it gets down to uh, microbiome data, which has many organisms and many genes. Here's a case where in the, in the best case, you have a 16S profile where you've, um, you've made bins of taxa and you're trying to fill in those bins with reads from different um, 16S uh, observations you've made from your study. So in this case, really it's, it's more sparse. You only get about one to 3% of your total Excel table having any data at all. In this case, um, you can see the, the relationship here that you, that you find in a lung study, for instance, where on the x-axis is how deep you sequenced any sample, and on the y-axis is um, how many different bins that you were able to, to fill in with something, and in this case, OTUs. Well, as you go up on this, on this uh, curve, the deeper you sequence, the more diversity that you're finding, and so therefore you're spreading the data out even more. So when you have lots of zeros in your data matrix, you have to be able to account for that with your NGS data, and you might not want to look at um, uh, the zeros as absent, it's just that it wasn't sequenced deep enough to find out what the, what the abundance was. Okay, um, next point here is just that you'll probably have to write some sort of custom software along the way. Um, if you have a certain uh, interest. Uh, for instance, for us, we really thought that functional inference from bacterial population shifts uh, was estimated pretty well by some public software projects, but uh, we, had to, we had to make one that was up to date with all the new genomes. So we created one called pie filling that helps us go from the 16S shifts to the possible changes um, that could be happening functionally. And we'll be actually sharing that uh, with the public and our, our manuscripts in prep right now. Also, we found that there's a lot of noise in NGS data. Besides the undersampling problem, there's also um, missed calls, bases that are, uh, that are juxtaposed in the sequence themselves. And you can tell from the, um, uh, from the quality scores that that type of small changes can make you think there's more diversity than there really is. So a program called Clamper is being written here. It's already, we have a submission for this. It's already at, um, it's under review in Nature Methods. And this is a, uh, a system where uh, you can do some noise correction in NGS Amplicon data before you do your statistical analysis. Uh, and then also we've written software for the uh, phylochip hybridization data system, which is another way of looking at 16S data um, without sequencing, but just hybridizing in a high throughput way. And that software is, um, I've been described already in 2015. PhyloSeq is a program that's um, uh, written by our biostatistician here. Uh, Paul McMurdy, and that's uh, a great system that you might want to use to help organize your data, and that's a public project, so you're welcome to it. And Ola, I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, this is an in-house software for integrating lots of types of data streams. Okay, so now let's get into some examples. So like I mentioned earlier, we're going to go through four examples, and I'll try to go through them pretty quickly because I know time is running out. So the first one is diagnostic biomarkers in colorectal cancer. This will be a stool data set from 16S and it's a meta-analysis. The next one is how we uh, link host of microbiome uh, biomarkers to proposed new therapeutic routes. In this case, we'll be using colon biopsies, shotgun metatranscriptomics combined also with host transcriptomics. I'll touch on machine learning applications and then also do a comparison of 16S next generation sequencing and 16S hybridization um, to, to show the types of data you might expect and the strengths and weaknesses of each. Okay, so first thing to be aware of is this interstudy heterogeneity when you are doing 
meta-analysis. So here's a, uh, we call it ordination. Each point represents one stool sample. They're colored by which study the sample came from, and the distance between any two points shows how much overlap there is in the content of what organisms were found. So if two points are close together, they have very similar presence-absence detection, and if they're far apart, they have a dissimilar presence-absence um, uh, table of organisms. And so here, what we found right away is on the right-hand side is uh, Illumina projects, on the left-hand side was 454, then the 454 projects separated by which primers were used to, to amplify up the, um, a certain variable region of 16S gene. And so keep this in mind that you're not gonna, your data is going to have to be, um, uh, your method is going to have to be able to overcome this, this problem. When we looked at biomarkers in colorectal cancer using multiple data sets, we found a list of ones that could be really useful. So on the left-hand side is a bunch of taxa, um, and then there's a plot that shows what the observation was about that taxa in the studies. Blue point is the combined uh, result off of many uh, analyses what we, in these what we call forest plots. But you can see that although the blue uh, point might be on one side of the zero, meaning that's an increase on the right-hand side of, uh, in the disease state, and a decrease on the left-hand side in the disease state. You can see that the error bars uh, span quite a bit, uh, quite a bit uh, far out there, depending on which data set you're looking at. So uh, a robust system, um, you know, would have to take this into account and maybe normalize, of course, on one technology, one data collection technique. And if you're going to pick a very few number of biomarkers, then you might want to pick ones that are agreed upon by multiple um, study cohorts and by multiple technologies that there really is a difference. And for instance, you can see some cases here, we have uh, the whole span of the error bars all on one side of the zero. And those ones might be ones that you want to pick first. This is uh, uh, the topic of a, a poster that's also available if you want more details. Um, and that's connected to this, this Lab Roots presentation too from the website. Okay, then after you have this data and you've organized it, your choice of bioinformatics pipelines will make a difference on your findings. So here we took that same data set and we ran it through three different pipelines. One pipeline, a popular one called CHIME. Uh, CHIME uses the Green Genes Reference Database and we ran the default system of CHIME, which is basically what's called closed reference, where every read is reflected against a, um, a pre-clustered version of the database and you count how many times you hit every cluster in the database and that's your OT table. The second pipeline, we used um, the strain select database, which I mentioned earlier is our, uh, is our internal effort to keep all the strains organized, all the data about each strain connected well, and then when we have 16S data, we can connect it to the strain that most likely it came from. Um, and then after we do the strain select um, mapping, then we use uh, some of the techniques that are part of the UPARS package to account for um, removing errors or removing sequences that are highly uh, errant. From that, uh, we have an OTU table as well. So two different pipelines, two different OTU tables. And then we use random forest, um, in this case, to determine which data set would be the most useful for predicting disease, or predicting a, that a, a sample came from a diseased patient versus a healthy patient. So pipeline one's on the left, and the big difference here is that specificity was 78%. On the right-hand side, we had 90% specificity. So we were able to achieve higher specificity as the biggest difference in this case. So that means that in our case, 90% of the negative calls were true negatives. So organizing your data against a modern database in a very systematic way uh, will help in the de deciphering the data and using it to, to pick your biomarkers. Uh, by the way, this work was done with UT Health, uh, and that, there's some authors down here, uh, also with Baylor, that's um, uh, working on this publication right now too. Okay, the next topic is how you going, if you want to integrate this data to make therapeutic um, inferences, then uh, you might have one biospecimen with many different types of data. In this case, on the left-hand side, we're showing a picture of a biopsy. A biopsy has microbes, a, the biopsy has human cells. So we'd separate the RNA and DNA, sequence, hybridize both to the arrays or NGS systems, and then we end up with um, mRNA profiles, we end up with keg orthologs, uh, we end up with um, uh, taxonomic shifts as well. So the system we, we would do that with is basically mostly bioinformatics. After the sequences are, are created, 
After removing the poor quality ones, we separate host ones by mapping them to the human genome. Then we have leftover putative microbial sequences, and we can map those to known proteins with known functions. And then the host um, RNA uh, can be mapped to their genes, and we get expression levels. And then we're trying to find significant changes that occur in the microbes that have mechanisms of interactions that are plausible on the host side. So we use a system called causal network analysis to determine the microbial or determine the host changes. Um, in this case, we find root regulators of the gene expression that um, could be controlling downstream effects of other genes on the host. Um, mapped out as a volcano plot here, what we're showing is after looking at multiple data sets, multiple cohorts, um, and the biopsies uh, gene expression of the host from those, we can find certain genes that are always upregulated. Uh, or sorry, not genes, but root regulators that control other genes that are always um, activated. Um, well, multiple data sets, I have those in red, and also uh, ones that are deactivated or um, are more activated in health on the green side. And these can be receptors, cytokines, kinases, um, but the key part is after we find these root regulators, if we know that there's a meta microbial metabolite that has affected that in past literature, we look for evidence that that metabolite is in the microbial data. So. This is the connection piece, then on the left-hand side, after scanning through the microbial data that we collected from the biopsies, we, we predict certain reactions that are overabundant and some that are underabundant in um, the microbiome, and we know they have effect on a certain compound, and if that compound is known to be a root regulator of gene expression, we call that a, a connection. And then those compounds can go on to our screening assays in the laboratory. So we call that OLA because it, it's a hypothesis origination linking assistant. It doesn't do the work for you, but it, it assists you in connecting the data to find uh, metabolites that um, could be points of interaction. Um, general machine learning applications are important too. As we talked about before, disease diagnostics with the CRC data set. Um, there's also patient stratification that you can be done um, if you have patients that respond and don't respond. All these data sets or all these microbial techniques can produce data that could be uh, fit into determining patient stratification. And the last one is peptide therapeutics, um, which is a machine learning application that comes naturally after you gather the data. So if you have peptides with known interactions to specific human regulatory gene proteins, and then you know those proteins' structural and physiochemical attributes, then you can run um, a machine learning algorithm over the, the proteins that you've unearthed uh, to find new candidates that also might interact with a, um, uh, with a host protein target. Um, for patient stratification, we did a great uh, study. We had 3,000 samples, um, and then from those, we had 2,000 different microbiome features, which are basically taxa or higher order taxa, like um, higher ranks families, classes, for instance. And then each, um, each sample had uh, many different clinical metadata variables as well. So it was much more, um, quite a few variables. So we tried a few different machine learning techniques. After comparing the results, you can identify certain features that are predictive of, um, of whether the drug can respond. And also, you can measure how successful uh, your predictor was um, considering after doing cross-validation cross and decide if you want to take that, that diagnostic further. Um, large data sets, of course, are really helpful for this. Uh, the last um, example is from a C. diff model organism, this hamster. Uh, if you wanted to determine which types of microbes would be indicative of uh, a micro of, of, let's say, the colon being resistant to C. diff infection versus susceptible versus resistant. So in this model, a hamster gets a, a dose of clindamycin uh, on day zero. Before day zero, they're resistant to a, a challenge of C. Div, uh, C. difficile. But after um, the clindamycin is administered, there's some sort of microbial knockdown that allows you to be uh, allows the hamster to be susceptible. And then later it recovers to resistant. And what, notice from this, from this curve, the cancer has not returned to the baseline right away. But even though it's after 15 days, it hasn't returned to baseline, there's still resistance acquired. So the question is, what biomarkers would let you know um, uh, if you're susceptible or resistant uh, to the uh, challenge? So we took the stool, we ran it through two different pipelines. One would be um, a V4 lumina pipeline, which we're pointing out here on the top, and also on a phyla chip. So the difference, main difference here is that um, sequencing uh, uses a small section of the 16S gene. The phyla chip uses the whole gene. The sequencing, we, we uh, generated 50,000 reads per sample. 
Um, and uh, under 50,000 reads for each one, about 20,000, 50,000 across the data sets. The phyla chip, of course, all one trillion molecules get placed onto the array uh, to try to hybridize uh, to their probes. And at the, both cases, we have O2 abundance tables. In both cases, you can do a broad separation where uh, in the blue circles is the um, starting stage on the, or sorry, the blue uh, polygon. On the orange polygon is where you have uh, the susceptible stage, and then uh, the purple is uh, back to resistant. So there's this stage here where the microbiome has shifted. Both techniques are able to, to organize the data well, uh, especially with animal studies you have controlled diets. At a large zoom out, um, you can see that uh, there's an effect from both ones. The next part, though, is very difficult. Um, we wanted to pick biomarkers from this data. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see certain phylochip uh, results of different taxa that on the top left, for instance, was low during the uh, first phase, then um, mid midway for the susceptible stage, phase, and then it ended up being high at the resistant phase, where in other cases, you can find um, places where on the third panel from the right, low and then high and then low again. So there's a diversity of patterns and very uh, nice reproducible shifts among all of the samples. So the hybridization technique allows you to see this. The sequencing technique also found some interesting significant um, differences. The significance level wasn't as high, and we think mainly it's because there's so many zeros in this data matrix. As you can see here in the very first one, there's a slight um, increase, a slightly higher amount in the resistant phase, and it drops down to pretty much zero at the other uh, phases. That can be interesting uh, as a um, maybe a repressive a bacteria that resists C, C. diff. But you don't see very many, a, a big variety of um, types of changes. Um, and this, this, uh, this problem of having a sparse matrix is the, is the reason why you don't see as much um, uh, heterogeneity among different patterns. So in this post, both these cases, these are the top 12 biomarkers from both pipeline, uh, from uh, the samples from both pipelines. So the file chip produced this greater number of significant biomarkers and it was able to uncover a wider range of population trajectories. And if you compare them as far as like um, having biomarkers work with in the lab, on one side you had 153 that passed certain tests, the other one you had eight. Uh, so the key is if you can run both of these analyses, if you just going to do 16S, run both of these, find intersects, and in the paper that we wrote, we showed a way you can find intersects that might lead to prioritization of the biomarkers you want to follow up on. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, if you are interested in accelerating your biomarker discovery program and uh, uh, we can work with you. We have a contact here. You can hit us through our website. But also, if you're an expert that's ready to already impact healthcare with a fresh approach, we're also hiring people. So I'm putting a plug out there also if you're somebody who's interested in applying for one of our um, positions, we have a careers page too. Thanks for your time. I guess we have time for some questions if. Uh, If we have a couple minutes. So Juan, if should I wait for you? Okay. Um, I have a question here of uh, let's see how many times does the microbiome how many times can it change? Well, it changes quite often. We know there's dietary effects, there's age effects, of course antibiotic usage. Uh, makes a big uh, change as well. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, reason why we think there's a therapeutic avenue in microbiome research. Although your genome doesn't change, your microbiome does, can be manipulated, and uh, there's uh, a ways you can make more stable changes versus transient changes. So uh, thanks for raising that question. That's great. Uh, let's see. Do we have any research for microbiome and autism people? research for microbiome and autism people. Well, hi, Todd. Um, thanks again for an excellent presentation and answering or asking the first question for me. Uh, we just had a little bit of a glitch, but I just want to remind the audience of how to uh, submit questions. You can submit questions via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, and we'll continue on with the question and answer session. Um, the next question comes from Oscar at um, UACG, uh, who asked, how many times does a microbiome can change? Uh, 
Okay. Um, yes, that's one I just answered, and we think it can change quite a bit depending on uh, diet, age, uh, antibiotic use, for instance. There's uh, ways that uh, there's many papers have shown that your microbiome can change throughout your uh, life and even in weeks. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Wenli at the Molecular Diagnostic Lab Consulting, uh, who asks, what is the spectra of chronic disease that are regulated by micro microbes in some significant way? That's a great question. Uh, the spectrum of diseases is, is broad, um, as evidenced by the literature that's um, really looked at many different things. And for instance, uh, you know, radiation disease uh, has an effect. Uh, I know there's people working on autism, um, MS. Now, the areas that we have looked into most closely, there's a spectrum of changes that are occurring that aren't the same among every disease. So for instance, uh, CRC was um, an area where we find pretty significant changes. Um, and then IBD, there's different changes that occur depending on your type of IBD. So for instance, Crohn's, the changes that you see in a stool sample aren't as dramatic as the ones in UC. Um, and metabolic diseases too, it's more subtle. So I think the big question that has to be answered still in global microbiome um, look is if you were to take all the diseases and let's say you look stick with one stool type of specimen stool and you had one extraction technique and one um, data collection technique if you could take all that data set and then decide if you can rank all the diseases by what's the effect size of the microbiome uh, i think that's going to be an interesting meta-analysis that's upcoming um, that i'm sure academic groups must be having that underway as well right now uh, but it's a it's a what you find is that when you read one paper, it seems very important because the focus is on that disease. If you put many different diseases on the same scale, you might be able to see which diseases have the largest microbiome effect that you can detect. It also depends on which sample you're looking at. So a stool sample might not be the best one for um, uh, colitis. Uh, maybe the microbiome change that's occurring in the, in the mucosa, which is where the actual disease area is, is going to contain much more information and so, for instance, not taking the easiest biospecimen, but finding the biospecimen that's most appropriate will affect how you uh, pick your biomarkers. Great. Uh, next, we have a question from James, um, who asked, does the innate immune system link the nutrient-dependent microRNA ohm to the ecological adaptation and biodiversity via the human gut microbiome, metabolic networks, genetic networks, and RNA-mediated amino acid substitutions? Uh, yes, so we think so. I mean, the immunologists that are here at Second Genome um, definitely have a focus on the innate immune system. Um, and there, there's plenty of links. Now, the microRNAome, I can't really uh, comment on. Um, but we expect that uh, microRNAs, of course, can control gene expression. And there's a big question out there of whether some of the microbes themselves have adapted techniques to manipulate gene expression at the microRNA level. So, you know, a hypothesis that might be underway at a university, for instance, um, might be that if you took all the transcripts made by the microbiome, which of those um, match uh, microRNA controlling structures, in other words, can match a, an area that can silence um, gene expression, and is there a way to get that DNA or get those RNA transcripts in enough to have control? Um, so there's, I'd imagine that uh, microbes have adapted ways to control their environment, maybe using microRNA also. Um, of course, the metabolic networks we think are um, very interesting because the metabolites that the microbes can produce or consume, um, some of those are um, uh, ligands themselves, receptors that uh, trigger a main, uh, or sorry, innate immune systems. Uh, so I hope that answers your question.
Okay. Uh, next, we have another question from Oscar who asks, do you have any research for microbiome in autism, autistic people, I guess? I should mark that one as answered. Um, yeah, I'll mark that one as answered. So we talked about that a couple times. Okay. Uh, next, we have a question from uh, Juan, who asks um, about the accuracy on identification of bacteria. He asks if it is possible to assign. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to read it down here. Is it possible to assign species level names with only 500 nucleotides with 16S rRNA genes? If not genus level, is it enough for pathogen identification? And are you improving identification with longer reads? And do you think um, that the movement in this field is going to PacBio or Inanapore? Lots of questions. Great questions. Um, 500 bases can be enough to make a species call if the reference database is unique in that region for that species. Now, if you're looking at E. coli strains or trying to differentiate E. coli from salmonella, you might have a hard time doing that. The 16S gene um, looks very similar among those species. But there's some eubacterium, for instance, that have distinct 16S genes, even though they are closely related genera, or the, the species are on the same genera. So, and there's not a one answer fits all. The question always is, given the reference database and given the sequence length and region that you selected to amplify, um, you can pre-look at the reference database and see if there's a significant uh, difference between uh, reference genes. So, uh, of course, longer is always better. The more variable regions you cover, the more likely you are going to be able to differentiate organisms. But I would say that in most cases, when you have a 16S gene, that you've seen as a significant change, it might, you should prepare that it maps to multiple genomes, or in other words, multiple strains. And sometimes those strains are in different species. And the word species really is a historical word uh, where an organism has been named a certain way. Uh, when you actually treat them out, uh, you don't always see the same monophyletic branch for what we call a species before. But suffice it to say that once you have a 16S biomarker, there's probably multiple strains that it could be coming from. So it's always good to have a follow-up technique, metagenomics or maybe a qPCR for other genes on that genome to differentiate uh, if you really need to get a strain level. For us, when we want to do some protein mining, well, if we have a 16S change that maps to, let's say, five different genomes, we can mine proteins from all those genomes as long as you have a medium or high throughput um, uh, processing pipeline for your proteins. So if you don't have that, then you might want to have some upfront work to, to distinguish uh, which strain you have. Great question. Now, when it comes to Lumina and PacBio, I can just give you my opinion on this. Um, or sorry, PacBio versus Nanopore. Uh, the PacBio system, um, from what I understand, has some higher error rates, but if you can circularize your DNA and pass over it multiple times in the sequencing, that helps correct it. Uh, so when a Lumina is able to do, uh, let's say, uh, a lap three or four times around a 1500 base pair uh, segment, then that should be really an excellent technique to differentiate, um, uh, you know, different species. The downside is it might be expensive to, to do millions of reads at that level. Um, so we'll have to kind of see. Now, I heard Lumina has a new machine out. It's a smaller footprint. It's supposed to be less expensive to operate, so that might be a change. I haven't really kept up with what their new price point is going to be for that product. Nanopore data, I haven't looked at myself. Um, but uh, what's exciting about that is maybe this portability to be able to take it into the clinic or on location at an um, environmental site. So I think that's promising too. But the key thing is multiple variable regions, all nine would be the best, and then having a technique that can really look at all trillion molecules in a sample that you prepare, um, those are the, what we really need to get to eventually. I think you alluded to this answer earlier, but um, Pu asks, Pui asks uh, from ProLab Development asks, are there any, uh, sorry, I just lost it. Are there any general characteristics required 
for inter ideal internal controls in molecular assays. Great question. Um, yeah, this is a topic that uh, I put in the abstract, but I didn't have time to get to. But this is a very important, um, uh, dear to my heart issue. The general characteristics for um, internal controls should be this. They should be able to be spiked into every single sample and not interfere with the sample itself. They should be quantitative, meaning that there's a whole ladder of these spike-ins um, so that you can be sure that across all your samples, if you have this um, molecule in there, at one ten thousandth of the max that every measurement you've made for all your samples also shows, shows it at one ten thousandth of the max. And if you have uh, enough room for these spikes into whatever your system is, uh, then you should be able to detect changes in those spikes by put, spiking different amounts into different materials. So um, this has been difficult in NGS sequencing because by putting spike-ins into your um, NGS, you're actually using up your reads that you want for your sample. So we found this, it's more simple to do that with hybridization. So for instance, in every single 16S phyla chip, there's a panel of 20 um, spike-in genes that aren't 16S, they're just foreign alien genes that go, goes into every sample. And then you can look at, after you're done with all of your sample processing and data analysis, you can be sure that those proteins were measured at their correct concentrations and had very little variation across all samples. Then you can QC that batch, be able to say that I was able to do quantitative analysis on this. Otherwise, you don't know when um, your actual analytes are changing in concentration, if that was a depth question, if that was a biological change, or just a technical error. So being able to have a technical spike in into all your samples, whether it be sequencing, metabolomics has uh, an easier way to do this, then um, uh, I think that's really important. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, next, well, we have another question from one at Live Sequencing who asks, why Green Genes database is better than um, RDP database, where Green Genes is smaller? Great question. Thank you for bringing that up. So, Really, there's multiple 16S databases that are out there. Um, and RDP, the Ribosome Database Project from uh, Michigan, is an excellent resource. Um, and so is Silva, which is another one that's uh, maintained in Germany. Um, and so there's no reason why you couldn't try all of them and find out what the pros and cons are. The reason that I like green genes and the roots of it um, is because the backbone behind green genes is an actual tree that's um, created de novo off of the 16S diversity that's seen among organisms that have been cultured and non-cultured. So um, in the 2013 uh, you know, version, uh, at that point, all the data was taken as a snapshot in time. A tree was created, and then um, a rational system of placing names of different nodes was applied. So instead of using a subjective um, measure to decide which node in the tree should be the genus and which node should get the um, word Enterobacteriaceae and which one should get um, Pseudomonodaceae, uh, the historical nomenclature was used as a guide, but the tree itself was used to determine a monophyletic group. So for instance, um, it's hard to differentiate E. coli and um, serratia in this tree. And so it's unclear whether E. coli and serratia and some of its other near names like salmonella are really truly monophyletic uh, genera or really they um, are just different strains that are very closely related. And so the green genes tree helps reflect that. Now, in an upcoming version, um, the tree won't be made just on the 16S genes, but the tree is made actually by calculating distances across multiple genes in the genomes. The genomics era has really flourished with uh, Lumino 454 sequencing, so many more genomes have been drafted. And some of these genomes even have a good 16S gene um, sequence. Not all of them, but many of them have a good 16S gene um, that we can pull out along with the other uh, genes that code for other proteins and then create one tree. And I know that, that effort's underway at uh, UC Berkeley and University of Queensland, Queensland 
and these universities have different, different uh, let's say, opinions about which, which genes to use, but the key thing is it's a reproducible way to come up with a taxonomy instead of historical nomenclature winning out. And I think the RDP uh, is still really focused on the Burgess Manual for um, nomenclature, which is fine, and I think it's a great historical way to, to go forward, or historical way to keep those names preserved over time. But I think the molecular methods that drive taxonomy are going to keep maturing, and Green Gene's focus has been to stay with those molecular methods. Okay, uh, next we have another question from Winley who asked, do you study microbiomes in other organs besides stool? Great question. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, I think a lot of people, when they hear microbiome, they think stool. Um, when I hear microbiome, I think of just communities of bacteria that interact with each other. So that microbiome can exist on your skin, it can exist in your mouth, it can exist on a surface that you've touched or, or air that you inhale. So um, yeah, we work on a lot of different types. So for instance, a uh, oral biopsies of cancer patients have been interesting. We have lung sputum that we've looked at from uh, cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, of course, we talked about biopsies of the gut uh, lining that are also really interesting. Um, skin is more difficult to work with. But uh, we also do microbiome work on skin samples. Um, so there's different partners and clients that have come to us with, with uh, different hypotheses, and they've gone and collected the right source. Not all those hypotheses um, require a stool sample. So um, absolutely, I think the, the literature is full of examples of, of reliable ways to get DNA or RNA out of samples besides just stool. Stool is just a very popular one to work with. Good to know. Um, so we have time for one last question who comes from uh, Corinne who asks uh, if you can comment on the influence of dietary habits on the universality of these biomarkers. It definitely um, reduces the universality of the biomarkers because diet interactions with the microbiome are real. So this is why we like these studies um, where we have cohorts from different parts of the world eating different diets and sometimes different age groups as well. This is the only way to get robust biomarkers. You're trying to find biomarkers that are present in the disease state, not in a healthy state, irrespective of some of the dietary changes. Now, sometimes it's hard to, de to deconvolute. So for instance, um, certain IBD patients eat certain foods more often than non-IBD patients. And so there's that confounding variable that can, that can occur as well. So um, the, the big answer there is multiple cohorts and uh, don't focus just on one study. If you're going to start doing meta-analysis, you want to pull lots of studies together and see ones that um, have a um, variation that's not just controlled by diet. Um, but thousands of samples are really useful for that. Thank you. Okay, well, once again, I'd like to thank Todd for his fantastic presentation. It was really informative. Do you have any comments, final comments for us before we go? Sure, yeah, the final comments are just um, basically a thank you to uh, those of you who stuck with the presentation. I, I definitely feel like I had to gloss over a lot of topics to get through a big overview in one hour, but um, you can email me uh, at Todd at Second Genome if you have follow-up questions. I'm happy to help out however I can. Thank you. Well, thank you once again.
um, and I to remind the audience that today's webcast will be on the, available for on-demand viewing through to October of 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when it's available for on-demand and posted on labroots.com. Please feel free to forward this announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for logging in today and participating, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.